direct the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation. And it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And I always love collaborating with my uh, close friend and partner, Daniel Levy, who heads and directs the Middle East Policy Initiative here. He's a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. He has a great blog called Prospects for Peace, and he's a senior fellow uh, as well with the Century Foundation. And if uh, uh, those of you who haven't had an opportunity to know Daniel, uh, this is part of our <coughs> covert campaign uh, here in Washington to broaden discussion of Middle East, particularly Israel-Palestine issues, uh, in part by importing the debate from Israel uh, and today Palestine. Uh, which I found in their own press over there have a much wider discussion on these issues than we tend to have here in Washington. I think you've noticed it widen somewhat in the United States over the last year and a half because of Daniel Levy's presence, uh, and I want to congratulate him on that. I also, we have today with us Rita Hauser, who's president of the Hauser Foundation. More importantly, she's the chairman of uh, the Director's Council for the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. She's chair of the International Peace Academy, an organization affiliated with the United Nations, uh, a chair uh, of the advisory board of the International Crisis Group, uh, founding chair of the advisory uh, board of the RAND uh, Center for Middle East Pol Public Policy and a member of RAND Corporation's board. And, and frankly, w what is not on, on, on the Vita, but I think is there, is that Rita is one of the attorneys who really opened up uh, much of the legal thoroughfare into the Middle East for a long time ago and is a really seasoned hand at discussing uh, the legal dimensions, the international law dimensions, and just the bilateral realities of um, U.S. interaction with that part of the world. And we're very honored to have us with, with us today Mustafa Barghouti. Uh, Mustafa is president of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society, uh, which designs and provides high-quality health care and services to more than one million Palestinians each year. Dr. Barghouti was also one of the delegates involved in the Madrid peace negotiations initiated in 1991 and one of the founders of the Palestinian, Palestinian National Initiative, which he still directs, still leads. Uh, he he uh, is all, was also a candidate for the presidency of the Palestinian National Authority and has served on the Palestinian Legislative Council as a Minister of Information and is today still a member of the Palestinian National Assembly. Uh, what we're going to do today, I also want to say a quick thanks to uh, Senator Gary Hart, who's going to listen to just the first few minutes of this, who's dropping by. Uh, uh, it's great to see Senator Hart in Washington. But um, what we're going to do is have Dr. Barghouti uh, open up with comments and Rita Hauser offer her perspective as well. And then in reaction, Daniel Levy will uh, uh, share, share some uh, uh, words of wisdom. And then I'm going to help orchestrate and moderate a discussion with all of you. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Mustafa Bar Barghouti. Three hours. Three hours. Uh, three hours, but if you make it ten minutes, it would be great. <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks a lot for hosting me. I'm very happy to be with the Rita Hauser one more time. We haven't met in a while, and uh, I hope that this meeting will be a beginning of maybe some new joint activity in the future. Um, <clears throat> I'll uh, make some quick remarks because I think uh, in 10 minutes and then maybe we will devote most of the time to discussion and I'm sure you have many questions. But uh, maybe I'll just uh, relate to certain specific things that are not discussed enough in my opinion in the media and the press and probably here. The first issue is uh, uh, related to the internal Palestinian you know, uh, situation where, of course, uh, people hardly discuss the question of why Hamas succeeded in the uh, last elections. And uh, I think one has to emphasize that uh, the main, one of the main reasons why Hamas got the majority was the failure of the peace process as such, and in particular, the failure of Oslo agreements. And uh, that is an issue that is overlooked frequently. A failure of provision of a solution, uh, the fact that instead of building uh, confidence on the ground, what was built is uh, more distrust. And the second factor that led to the success of Hamas was uh, actually the failure of uh, Fatah to conduct internal reform and uh, to build uh, real institutions. Uh, the combination of these factors led to the success of Hamas. But uh, in my opinion, while uh, the success of Hamas was only one side of the story, the other side of the story, which is very important, <coughs> was that Palestinians have managed, regardless of occupation and regardless of oppression and regardless of uh, 40 years of occupation, actually, to build the best democracy in the Arab world. 
and to practice the best democracy in the Arab world. Something that was starting to have an effect on the whole region. And uh, while some people would understand and justify the fact that Hamas government was isolated and embargoed, I think there, is, there can be no justification whatsoever why the national unity government, which was the form formation of which was in a way an admission from the side of Hamas that it got, cannot govern at, alone, although it got a majority, the fact that we had a national unity government which represented 96% of the Palestinian electorate and came up with a very flexible program, and I was part of that government, I actually helped creating it by mediating between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, that government came up with a very flexible program, a program that uh, was calling for two-state solution, a program that uh, offered complete cease of all forms of violence, given that it would be from both sides, uh, the abstention of violence. And then it supported the Arab initiative, which uh, would have been a very good base for having a peaceful solution. And finally, that government declared that it is ready to honor and respect international law, international humanitarian law, and existing agreements. And the word to honor agreements was written even in English to confirm and affirm that particular aspect. Unfortunately, that government was isolated, embargoed in a very severe way, first, of course, by Israel, and then by the United States and the international community. And I think there was a very serious loss of a very good opportunity then uh, where all the Palestinian groups would have been brought into a process. Uh, some people complain about Hamas connections with, Ham with, with Iran. I think that was a very good opportunity to make Hamas more independent from Iran and to strengthen the more moderate and more uh, probably reasonable side of that organization to engage uh, so that it would itself engage into a process. Anyhow, this did not happen, and uh, the division took place. And uh, that is leading now to a very dangerous phenomena, because what is happening is really a paralysis of the whole democratic institution, a uh, destruction of that very good model that we've managed to build of democracy, a situation where we have two governments, one in Gaza and one in the West Bank, both lacking legitimacy and both fighting for legitimacy. Uh, but the worst thing is that... Uh, we could risk having two autocr autocracies instead of one democratic system. And at the same time, what we see is that uh, the negotiations issues are going, or the negotiation process is going back to the same old way, uh, uh, without serious efforts to put emphasis on solving the problems. At the same time, this regression from the model of democracy is my, in my opinion, uh, making even the reform uh, groups inside Fatah uh, uh, decline in their effects. And uh, of course, it has led to the strengthening of the more radical part in Hamas. My second point that I would like to emphasize is that uh, while, uh, peop uh, while people talk about Hamas and Fatah a lot, very little attention is given to a very important third phenomena which we represent and that is the growth of a democratic non-Fatah, non-Hamas movement that is increasingly becoming more important and more popular. The very good show that we had in the presidential elections where we got 20% uh, of the votes officially and uh, taking the second place and then uh, the fact that we've managed to be a, ma a major mediating force between Fatah and Hamas, and now the crucial role that we play in the Palestinian realm, where people who are disillusioned already between, with Fatah and with Hamas are looking for a different third alternative, is, in my opinion, an important uh, dimension that has to be looked at and, and considered, uh, especially in analyzing a lot of polls data that are coming out of the occupied territories. My third point is about, uh, while there is a talk about uh, negotiations and discussions, I'm sorry to say that uh, in reality, on the ground, there are four very serious processes that are happening, and I must honestly describe them to you. The first process is the continuation of settlement activities in, at a very uh, rather uh, speedy way, 
speed level. Uh, the, we all know that since Oslo was signed 14 years ago, the number of Israeli settlers and Israeli illegal settlements have doubled in uh, the occupied territories. The second process is the building of the wall, which is not just a wall. It's, uh, I know it's described here as a fence, and a fence is something uh, mild that you have between you and your neighbors. But the fact that it is called a fence does not change its nature, being an eight to nine high meters, uh, eight to nine meters high concrete wall, uh, three times the length of Berlin Wall, and uh, in 90 percent of the cases, a wall that is not separating Palestinians from Israelis, but separating Palestinians from Palestinians, because in 90 percent of the cases, it is inside the occupied territories. And what we see is that this wall by itself is marking the future uh, borders, uh, is practically imposing a de facto reality unilaterally by Israel without negotiations. The third factor, which I know it's a bit annoying to use this word, but the truth is there is an evolving reality, or an, a reality has evolved on the ground where severe discrimination takes place between Palestinians and Israelis, where, for instance, the consumption of water that is allowed for Palestinians in the West Bank is no more than 50 cubic meters per capita per year, while Israeli settlers are allowed to use 2,400 cubic meters of the water of the West Bank. The outcome is that out of 938 million cubic meters of water produced in the West Bank, Israel <coughs> takes away almost 800. Uh, it's a place where Segregation has reached a level of not only segregating people from each other, but uh, it's a situation where even segregation of roads and streets, something that never happened in the history of human beings, has taken place. Even in South Africa, in the worst time of apartheid, this did not happen. It's a situation where the GDP in Israel was six times more than the Palestinian GDP back in 1993, and now it is 30 times more. At the same time, Palestinians are obliged to buy, Israeli, uh, to buy products at Israeli market price. And they're obliged to give their taxes to Israel. And then it is up to Israel to give back the taxes to the Palestinian government or not, depending on how Israel feels about that government at that particular point. And finally, there is this decision of separating Gaza from the West Bank and declaring it as an hostile entity, which, by the way, is leading to a very severe humanitarian crisis. I don't want to go into the description of that. If you're interested, I can do that later. But what is happening, if you combine all these things together, is that we're getting to a point where uh, practically Israel is de facto creating a reality that can only be described as a status of apartheid. I know it's a harsh word. I know that many people would hesitate to use it, but that's the truth. It's apartheid. And I don't think this is good neither for Palestinians or for Israelis. It's not good for the future of our relationships. And uh, the biggest difficulty we are facing here now, at the time when we are uh, looking forward to this Annapolis meeting, is that the main discussion now between Palestinians and Israelis is about one thing that the Israel, whether to negotiate the final status or not. It's amazing that the discussion is about will we negotiate final status or not. If that is the case, then why the meeting is going to take place? That is the problem. Israel says, and I think you can look at Barak's statement, Olmart's statement. Olmart says we need 20 to 30 years to solve the final status issues. Barak says we should avoid them completely and concentrate on preparing for early elections in 2008. And he wants, even if there is an agreement, a full freedom of the movement and action of the Israeli army inside the occupied territories. Livni says avoid the final status issues. Shas threatens if the issue of Jerusalem is put on the table, they will get out of the government. So in such a situation, it is really amazing that one has to struggle just to have the issues discussed on the table. That's why I say there are four specific conditions that are needed if we want really Annapolis to make a difference. The first need is that Israel should immediately freeze all settlement activities and declare that. This is not a big thing to ask for, given that it is the point number one in the roadmap. 
The second thing that Israel must stop building the wall because by continuing building the wall, it is continuing to, al to annex territory and imposing the facts on the ground. And third, there has to be a reversal <coughs> of the decision of declaring Gaza as an enemy entity. And finally, there has to be a clear timetable to discuss the final status issues. I mean Jerusalem, the refugees, the issue of borders, and, uh, uh, and uh, the settlements. Without doing that, I am afraid that all we will have is another meeting, or another, another uh, as they call it, photo opportunity, and uh, we will not see serious and real progress forwards. And uh, I think uh, it's quite important to remember that uh, uh, there, is, there might be a chance, and the chance is in the fact that all the Arabs, for the first time maybe, and all Palestinians, are ready to accept one project, which is uh, the Arab Initiative. And the Arab Initiative is clear. It says end of occupation of all occupied territories, discussion of the issue of refugees and finding a solution to it, and then complete peace and complete normalization with Israel. It's a clear, uh, I think, uh, map, a clear uh, message and a clear project. But uh, unfortunately, more than any time before, we do not see a partner in Israel that is ready to deal with all the major and most serious issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Rita, how's it? <clears throat> okay, I can do it right from here if it's okay. Um, thank you very much for having me, and I'm very glad to be with my friend Mustafa again. I don't see him often enough. Uh, I noted before that my companions here were looking at their notes. He was looking in Hebrew, and he was looking in Arabic, and I'm going to speak in plain English, if that's okay. And I'd like to be as plain as I can, because I, I think... I think the situation is simply dire. It's beyond dire. If I could think of a good word in English, I would maybe say catastrophic. But it's about where it is, and you've heard a good description of it without getting the humanitarian equation, which is really beyond catastrophic, uh, from Mustafa. Uh, I used to say, you know, I've been at this, this issue for so long, and I was always a very optimistic because I thought the logic of the situation dictated the solution that we all know, and it's one of these bizarre long-term conflicts where the contours of the solution are plain and are visible and have been so for decades, and the parties cannot get themselves to that obvious solution, and I don't have to reiterate them as you we all know what they are, and in fact as time goes on they seem to get further away from the, the obvious solution rather than closer to it. So if it was in my DNA, I was joking before to say it'll probably be on my tombstone because I have now come to the view, alas, that this is not a, a conflict that is going to be resolved in the, in the serious sense of resolution for a very long time to come in the absence of some grave, unforeseeable events that I have tried to foresee but cannot conjure up. Uh, so I'll take it step by step from the American policy. I think this conference, if that's what it is, and isn't even being called a conference, maybe it's called a meeting, I don't know what the last word is for Annapolis, is, is, is frankly loony. It's a, it's a gathering where there is no agenda, where it isn't clear who's coming, where most of the Arab countries have said they won't participate, and if they do, they will do so at a fairly low level. Uh, it'll produce maybe an op-ed, uh, a photo op uh, result. But the failure of this gathering, which will be the last effort of this administration on this issue, will have serious consequences, just as the failure of the war in Iraq has serious consequences. As I remember in teaching students in international law and relations, I always used to say success is wonderful, but failure has many grave consequences, and some of them you don't foresee for a long time to come. The failure of Oslo, we're seeing now the failure of a conference where the U.S. is putting whatever is left of this administration's energy is a very dire matter, and I cannot see between now and November, unless they postpone it, how are you going to get something together that makes any sense? Why? For one, 
a large element of the, of the Palestinian side of the equation to wit Hamas is not only disinvited, it's positively being uh, looked at as a, to be eliminated. So you're going to have a discussion in which a sizable segment of the population represented by a democratic election which produced Hamas is in no way represented and their point of view is no way, nowhere in place. So it strikes me just as a, as a negotiating matter, a very foolish way to go about it. This administration will not acknowledge Hamas until the end of the administration, <coughs> since Hamas is not going to come around suddenly and recognize Israel and do all the things that are required. Maybe they'll talk about some generalities of a final status solution in Annapolis, but as I said in my opening comments, everybody knows what the final state solution is going to look like, so I don't see where they get very much further in that. Uh, even if they were to come to any kind of anything in Annapolis, uh, Abbas is certainly not able to deliver the Palestinian people for reasons that Mustafa well delineated, neither Hamas nor a large part of Fatah would even follow it, and then a sizable group now that is seeking an independence of either Hamas or Fatah for all the reasons that we all know as well. And Israel is having an election with a very uh, weakened prime minister who will stagger probably to the end of his term. And if you look to, to labor, uh, Barak is now, I think, on by his statements, further right than Sharon ever was. So I don't really see how the Israeli side of the equation comes together. And even if you got a statement in Annapolis where you say no more settlement building, by my count we've had at least five of those if not more, that I've lost track of, but it doesn't do anything on the ground. I mean, Oslo called for that and subsequent meetings between the parties at Y and other places called for no more settlement building, but settlements continue to be built under the rubric of natural expansion of existing settlements and so on. The Israeli courts mitigated a little bit around the edges, but basically settlement building and the wall <coughs> continues apace. I don't see a very happy outcome. Maybe the next administration would seek to attack this problem in a different way. Uh, looking forward, and we're working on a big project with some of the research institutes to give something to the next president, whoever it is, to say this is what an agenda ought to be for the Middle East. Realistically speaking, the next president's got one big elephant in the room, and that's Iraq, which is going to be obviously the, the first and foremost issue for the next administration, plus the looming Iran crisis. So putting that together, I think the only thing that the next administration could do that would, be, would make sense to me would be to convene a meeting of all of the Arab states and invite Israel as well, something a la Madrid, where you would say all these issues are now intertwined. They all are bearing on one another, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, the Lebanon crisis, Israel, Palestine. Let's try to get them resolved in some kind of a summit conference where you would have separate working groups, which is what was done at, uh, at Madrid. And frankly, if you look at models, Madrid was really the only successful international conference that we've had on this issue in modern history. So uh, that's what I would try to do, to bring all of the components together and see whether or not by interplaying Iran, Iraq, then Hezbollah, Syria, you could finally bring the forces together that would lead to some resolution. And of course, for me, I would include the Hamas leadership at such a meeting. Now, it's easily doable because I lived through the Madrid conference and I remember the huge stink in this country about inviting a Palestinian delegation. They had to be part of the Jordanian delegation. And we did a lot of dances and mirrors, but the Palestinians came to Washington and they got their instructions from Arafat. And while they were cloaked within the Jordanian administration, everybody understood they were dealing with the Palestinians. And I think in the same way, you would find some kind of a fig leaf to bring Hamas to such a conference. That's the only positive thing that I can put on the table because in the time from here to the end of this administration, I see very little that is going to mitigate the situation in, in any manner or form. And if anything, I could spell out a lot of worse scenarios, but the scenario that you heard from Mustafa is bad enough. So I don't want to make for further indigestion and leave it at that. 
but I would hope that we could work toward um, a positive coming together with a new president. Now, just as a PS, as I was saying when we were having lunch, I don't see any intelligent discussion on this question coming out during the campaign, because campaigns <coughs> in this country for president, we all know what they are, and most of the candidates will mouth the usual slogans and try a way to stay away from the landmines and not get uh, caught up in dramas about this question. And in any event, I think the uh, campaign will be dominated by the Iraq issue and the looming Iran crisis. So those, when Palestine, Israel will be a, a fairly secondary uh, issue in the presidential campaign. Everybody will make their speech, and that will be that. Will be that. So I'm looking beyond and trying to see how we can structure something that would be positive for the next administration. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, Daniel, comments and reactions? Okay. I mean, f f first of all, thank you all for being here, and Steve, for, for hosting this, and, and especially Mustafa and, and Rita. And use your lungs. And I'll use my lungs. <coughs> um, <laughs> I mean, first, I, I, I think, it, it, echoing something that Mustafa said, I'm very pleased that we can have those, those third forces in, in Palestinian politics uh, here with us. And, and uh, I'm as guilty as anyone else of, of, of presenting it exclusively as a, as a dichotomy, a binary between uh, Fatah and Hamas. And so I think it's a, it's a useful and important corrective. I don't know how far those forces can advance um, in, in the coming years inside Palestinian politics. I think there's potential there, and I, I think we have the, um, the opportunity here to, to, to be one, one of the people who's leading that effort. Um, the other thing that, 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 that I drew from that um, in particular is it's one thing, uh, myself who's not in a dialogue with Hamas, uh, looking at the material I can look at and drawing certain conclusions and sharing them with you when we do events here, uh, and, and, and MJ and Matt Iglesias and other analysts here in Washington uh, drawing those conclusions. It's a second thing, occasionally hosting the people who've been part of a dialogue, Mark Perry who's with us, um, people who we've had here in the past, Rob Malley and others, and them sharing their impressions. It's still another thing to have Mustafa who mediated in those talks, who was a member of the uh, cabinet in the national unity government, sharing his own thoughts of the directions that Hamas could go in, was going in, and is now rolling back from going in as a consequence of the political decisions that have been made, yes, in Palestine, but also elsewhere, and uh, not insignificantly uh, elsewhere. I guess one thing I, I, I have to say in response, and, and I know I'm pushing on an open door here, Mustafa, but nonetheless it merits to be said is it, it's difficult to be more Palestinian than the Palestinians and if the official negotiators uh, continue negotiations under conditions of non-settlement freeze construction of the separation barrier and a siege on Gaza then everyone else is is much weakened in uh, in in raising those issues I uh, you know I can't imagine how difficult it was for President Abbas to attend a meeting with Prime Minister Olmert when the decision, hours after the decision of the tightening of the siege and the non-provision of essential supplies was made regarding Gaza. Um, Rita, you addressed the, the U.S. role. Um, and, and I'd almost tie in, in two, two of the main comments that, 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 that Mustafa and Rita made. And Mustafa, you talked about something that we have today that we haven't had in the past, in fact we'd have it, we've had it for five years already, which is the Arab Initiative as a consensual organizing principle coming out of the Middle East. Now I think the challenge for Israel is taking yes for an answer. Because for me the Arab Initiative is the moment where Israel unequivocally got to yes. We got to yes of accepting and is a reality of an Israel in the Middle East. We got to that yes with the whole Arab world, and I saw the National Unity Government as a, as a moment when we got to yes with Hamas, yes. as well as the local Palestinian manifestation of the Muslim brothers. And I don't think the other brothers would have been more brothers than the Palestinian brothers. So it was a, a, a region-wide moment of getting to yes. And if I'm going to be... 
maybe this is going too far, but if I'm going to translate it down to our local, to people's personal lives, sometimes you've been in such a long argument with someone that when they turn around and they say, you know what, okay, you're right, I'll accept that part of what you've been saying. It's kind of not enough. You kind of say, no, 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 I want you to accept my whole narrative, not just that I was right about particular issue X. And in that respect, I think Israel's found it very difficult to take yes for an answer. It's an internal problem. There are many issues that we have to deal with inside Israel. There is one external actor who could help us take yes for an answer. Unfortunately, there are still far too few signals that that external actor, the US, is going to help us take yes for an answer. I would say, in terms of Annapolis and the remaining 14 months, maybe four things that would, I, I would still, not that I hold out much hope, but suggest that could be uh, a starting point for the next administration that's better than the situation now. And those four would be, are we back in a serious negotiating space? In other words, can Annapolis and the continuation post-Annapolis mean that when whoever comes in in Jan of 09, there's an ongoing negotiating process? Something that, to the extent to which it existed in January of 2001, it didn't exist by February of 2001 after, we've had, after we'd had the elections in Israel. Second, can we be in a place where no or minimal harm is being done on the ground. Look, in 01, if you look at the first four years of this administration, every year there was a major set peace commitment on settlements and outposts, none of which were followed up. 01, the Mitchell Report. 02, the much vaunted Bush speech of 24th of June of that year, which laid out for the first time the state of Palestine. To be honest, it was more about regime change than anything else, but it certainly referred to the settlement freeze. 03, the roadmap. And 04, the exchange of letters between the President and Prime Minister Sharon. Each of those first four years, there was a commitment. There's a credibility problem now, why, which is why Annapolis will be tested much less by what is said by the sides, by the president, by whoever, and much more by what we see four days, 40 days, 100 days after Annapolis. And if the, the, the gap between the photo of the carrot that you get at Annapolis and the reality on the ground that you get 40 days later is stretched too far, then as Rita says, do no harm. At least don't make the situation worse, which we're very much in danger of doing. So the second thing, are we in a situation where on the ground things are at least not deteriorating? Three, which I think is absolutely crucial, are we closer to having a reconstituted Palestinian body politic? A reconstituted ability of the, of the, 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 the key parties to agree on rules of the game and to be interacting with one another politically rather than uh, in the way that they're interacting today. Rita was part of the effort in the, in the closing days of the Reagan administration where the Americans had their first official dialogue with the PLO. <coughs> Unfortunately, I don't see that happening uh, with Hamas. But uh, I think that's an absolutely essential thing. And to be honest, if non-success in Annapolis is what is more likely to encourage a new, realistic, internal Palestinian dialogue, then maybe something good comes out of non-success in Annapolis. And the, the fourth one is, is an inclusive uh, Arab engagement uh, on this issue, which I think Annapolis uh, is not unlikely uh, to deliver. Um, I, I, I think it's a stretch to, uh, to expect those things to happen. One thing I would say is, is politically for Olmert, Settlement freeze and timetable are things that I believe are easier in his ability to at least declare uh, than other things. So maybe that gives you something to start with.
Thanks. Thank you all uh, very much. I want to open the, the floor to discussion, but, but let me just raise one point that Rita, Rita Hauser was getting at. On one hand, Rita was saying America won't achieve its objectives in November, and yet the failure to achieve our objectives transmits to the world uh, the further impotence, if you will, of America in this time. And I was uh, quite interested when Richard Lugar, uh, in his opening statement during the Petraeus Crocker hearings about Iraq, essentially talked about our inability to sort of look at what the reality is one way or the other, Iraq, almost like a, a, a farmer planting his uh, crop in a floodplain. And it, 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 to me, seemed an apt metaphor for the Israeli situation, that to some degree, Israel's in a, in a floodplain, and to some degree, there are levees there. Uh, part of it's American security, part of it's Israel's own ability to, to deter uh, threats. But, but fundamentally, if you look at the fact that the geostrategic calculus has significantly changed, and if the world doubts American resolve or American ability to deliver on its objectives, does it not fundamentally change the costs of losing again uh, in an Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, situation. And I'd like to just get quick comments from, from Rita Hauser and Mustafa Barghouti on that, um, to, because I, I want to know whether this failure matters more than past failures, or, uh, and whether our objective should now, as, as Rita said, since we're going to fail anyway, is there a way to pull out a success by laying by civil society or by letters that Rita has signed with Brent Scowcroft and his big Brzezinski and Nancy Katzbaum Baker and others? Is it is it possible to lay railroad tracks so that the next administration has a more compelling uh, set of incentives to move forward than, than than may be the case now? Do you have any thoughts, Rita? Yeah, I, clearly, I I think failure at this time, however you define failure, and of course they'll define whatever they do in Annapolis as a success, whatever it may be, photo ops, a statement, uh, kisses on both cheeks, I mean, they'll, they'll define it as some success, a step forward. But in the real world, we will all understand that nothing much has particularly happened. Uh, and I think there will be a large setback because the parties <coughs> will see no way forward. And I don't know how you can continue the policy on the ground, which is, Daniel said, is one of the most important things, at least try to alleviate the situation on the ground for the Palestinians. I don't see that happening either out of a failed effort in Annapolis. So if, if I were doing this, uh, I would try to say, well, this is the first step toward a bigger initiative. And we're going to be working in the last year of my administration to bring together all the parties in a conference where we will be grappling with all of these issues. I don't, I, I don't mean to be a cynic, but I don't see that or hear that coming out of this administration on this issue. But you helped put President Bush in office. Yeah, well, that's another story. <laughs> but, 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 and, and you've pushed him on this, I take it. Yes. And he didn't listen. He was very pushed and in the beginning was quite amenable on the Palestine-Israeli issue. And then, like everything else, 9-11 changed the dimension. And I'm quite convinced that that is how you can explain a great deal of the policy of this administration. Because after that, Bush began to speak about this issue in terms of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And if you equate this issue to terrorism, then you arrive at a very to that not to say there aren't acts of terror that are committed, mm -hmm. But then you arrive at a very different conclusion about how you want to approach this problem, and that's how they've defined Hamas. Hmm. So it is very difficult to, be, to work your way out of the situation where you have blanket said parties are not acceptable, and that's, of course, what they did um, you know, in the long siege of Arafat. And whatever one wanted to say about that, there were many of us who told the administration, you know, you, you have no what comes next after Arafat scenario. You want to get rid of him because you've made him the big terrorist, but what happens after he disappears? What is the next step? They never had a next step, as I don't think they have a next step in Iraq at this point, and I don't think they have a next step in all this saber rattling about Iran. But in, in international life, you've got to always think about the next step and the step after the next step. And therefore, I'm just now, I've sort of given up on this interim period, and I'm saying, let's try to organize for a next administration, hopefully a president who will see bigger, and who sees now that all of these issues are interconnected. If I had to say anything of importance, to me anyway, it's that they're no longer isolated issues. You can't discuss Palestine without discussing 
Syria without discussing Lebanon, then there's Hezbollah, which takes you to Iran. You know, all these interconnections, they can't be unhitched anymore. There was a time when you could deal with the Palestine-Israel question in, in locus. I don't see that happening, and therefore I think you have to think bigger rather than smaller. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barkudi? Well, I guess uh, I think there are three major impacts of uh, failure. And unfortunately, up till now, we don't see signs of success. Let's be frank with each other. I don't know how this meeting will be, uh, will be there if uh, up till now they don't know when it's going to happen, what is the agenda, who's going to be invited, who's going to accept. Uh, and uh, everything now is concentrating only on one thing, which is to develop a piece of paper between Palestinians and Israelis, which is nothing but a small declaration of intent, not even a declaration of principles. And what is a new paper of declaration of intent would make, uh, what difference would it make if we already had a whole book of declaration of principles called Oslo that was never implemented? So all the signs are not very encouraging. Yet, if this failure takes place, I think it will have three major impacts. Uh, the, when uh, Ms. Rice was asked in the Congress why they are rushing with this meeting or why this uh, date of the meeting uh, or this timing of the meeting, she responded by saying we're going, we want to, to, to support and encourage the moderates in the Middle East. Well, obviously, a failure will not only discourage the moderates, but uh, will have a negative impact. Second factor is that uh, what message is the United States and uh, the international community sending to the Arab world and to the world in general? If people have managed to have a democratic process and had very good democratic elections that were observed by the Americans and internationals and then were recognized as the best uh, elections in the region ever, and still after that, uh, as uh, our colleague Yazid Sayyid was saying yesterday, if external forces uh, start playing games with results of democratic choice, and uh, then why won't internal forces do the same? And uh, if the ma what, what, what message would come to the world, to the Arab world in general? Uh, the message would be even if you, uh, that peaceful democratic ways of change are impossible. And that means sending a very dangerous message, which is that uh, if peaceful democratic ways are impossible, then people will, will, will make the conclusion that they have to turn to violence. That, to me, is the most uh, and biggest risk, uh, risk in this whole thing. But the third and most important, in my opinion, strategic risk is about the following. It is, it is really amazing that uh, after all these years, Rita remembers very well when Palestinians were told, and I think you were one of those who told Arafat that in your meeting with him with Stanley Scheinbaum and others, that just accept the two-state solution and accept two for two and accept that compromise and accept 67 borders and then you will get peace and everything will be okay. So Palestinians have made their historical part of accepting a compromise and believe me, that does not only apply to us or to Fatah, it also applies to Hamas. You are correct, Danny, when you say that Hamas practically accepted the Arab initiative and was ready to deal with it. But if we did that, our part of compromise, then what are we looking at now? Uh, when Israel even refuses to negotiate the issues. And I think I have here a map, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, <coughs> I think the whole story is in this map. Um, that was the partition plan, which didn't happen, of course. This was what Palestinians accepted, a two-state solution where Palestinians would have 23% of the land of Palestine instead of 45% that was assigned by partition plan. This was the compromise. This is what Clinton, what, uh, what Barack offered during Camp David. And this is what the Israeli government is offering by creating a wall that is in, enclaving inside the Palestinian territories and cutting, I mean, this is leading to pantostanization, to ghettoization, to a situation where there will be no contiguous entity. If settlements continue, and if the war continues, then this is the result. That raises the big strategic question, which is, and I think, again, Rice is correct when she says there is an imminent danger, an imminent risk that the whole two-state solution could vanish. And if that is the case, then what is the solution? 
Are we looking into, for instance, one state solution? where Palestinians and Israelis would live together in one democratic state with everybody having the same rights. I'm sure the Israelis don't want that because they want a Jewish state. Then if it's not two-state solution and it's not one-state solution, then what are we looking at? A creation or consolidation of an apartheid system that is worse than what prevailed in South Africa? This is not viable. Thank you. Let me, uh, uh, just before I open up, mention this uh, document, which I hadn't seen before. It, it, for our web viewers, it can be uh, retrieved at www.almubadara.org, A-L-M-U-B-A-D-A-R-A.org. Uh, interesting maps. I also so, have copies of people. And we have copies here for those here, but for the web, uh, download it there. So uh, questions from the floor? Yes, in the back, if you'll uh, identify yourself. Yes, Jack Greenblatt. Yes, thanks. Uh, do you think the impact of uh, Prime Minister Olmec's uh, declaration uh, declaring a, his ser very serious illness can play some kind of a positive role by bringing things existentially to the point we are in a life and death situation as I am. Let's think in terms of life and death rather than in terms of political posture. Does cancer help? No. <laughs> the, the reporting in the Israeli press is that uh, Olmert has an immediate bump in the polls. Uh, there, is a, there is sympathy out there. And really, people are appreciative that the Prime Minister has been transparent. Uh, obviously, people are contrasting it to what happened with, uh, with Sharon. Olmert did the right thing. And people also... I think there's an element here of a media that has been, I think, overly harsh on Ehud Olmert. Uh, just being a little bit honest for a moment about how attractive the alternatives are. And so I think there is, there, it doesn't do anything dramatic. And thankfully, Olmert's health situation, by the way, is not dramatic. Uh, but but it, it gives him a small bump. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Ross Anthony, I'm you, you talk about uh, the consequences of failure, and in some ways, the, the meeting now, I believe, planned for December 17th in Paris, the, the donors meeting, that might be even more important. Well, real quickly before that, Ross, um, we met in Jerusalem, right? The, yeah. it, so the transportation backbone in Palestine, <coughs> which is a RAND project, which not may, uh, and I think it's Big Brzezinski actually chairs the, does he chair the project, or yes, did he? Well, he chairs the advisory. And, and what is the state of your project? Well, I was in, I was in the, the region last week, as a matter of fact, talking to uh, various people, including the Prime Minister, so it's still very much alive in terms of an idea. Um, but but it, the RAND project was really much deeper than that. It was looking at what would be necessary to succeed across all sectors, health, education, economic development. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, lest we, uh, we mire ourselves into, into one solution, I think infrastructure is clearly a great need. Uh, the needs are, across the board are great. And, uh, you know, what, what, what should be done in the next thousand days, for instance, to, to really move the, the situation for Palestinians on the ground? The average Palestinian is forget the politics a second. Read. How do we, how do we yeah. Read it. Since I'm a RAN director of the board, I know the project very well, but, and when we engaged in it, it was always on the understanding that this presupposed that there would be some peaceful evolution, because it's very difficult to put into place any economic infrastructure as long as you have the current level of, uh, of strife. But it's good to have it out there to show that if you could reach some sort of agreement, there is a way, an easy, very easy way to make Palestine flourish. On the subject, and I'm glad you raised it, of the donors' conference, if Annapolis takes place at the time scheduled and doesn't produce anything more than one more declaration, I find it very hard to see what the donors are going to do. I mean, and they too have pledged money in the past donor conferences, but then they don't pay up. The, the pledge gets a lot of press, and then if you go and look, uh, 100 days later, 200 days later, they've paid in very little, including the U.S. 
And of course, we turn always to the Europeans to provide the, and some Asians, to provide the major donor funding for the Palestinians, and a great number of them have lost heart as well because a lot of the money has been unaccounted for, a lot of it has been lost in terrorist activities, blow up and so on. So my grave fear is that if you don't show anything out of Annapolis, this situation will just stagnate. It will continue to just ripple along like this with interspersed events uh, until you get to the American election, to get to the Israeli election, the usual pattern. And of course, it is grievous for the Palestinians living there. I should add that I watched uh, during one of the incursions, I don't know if it was Jenner or not, when the Israelis went in with tanks and blew up a lot of these nice looking buildings. I was in an airport uh, uh, with Yashka Fisher, who was just steaming that they were blowing up buildings that Germany Germans had built for. and paid for. Yeah. So there's still a memory of that uh, on the European side. Uh, but yes, sir, right here in the middle. Yeah, um, and then behind. Where's, where's the Trump policy yes. Uh, my question is, <coughs> my question is um, the other Palestinians want the agreements, at least they want their, their situations of their lives to improve. Um, I see no evidence that, the Israel, that there's any kind of a demand in Israel itself for any end to the status quo. I mean, people like me and people you know, on the um, peace side of the equation, we like to invoke polls and say that 65% of the Israelis want this and want that. Aren't those polls true? <laughs> well, I suppose they're yeah. polls. Yeah. Um, <coughs> But I don't see any, like, in other words, my, if, if a Prime Minister of Israel said right now, you know, there's nothing out there, um, the status quo is not so terrible, we got this wall, there's no more suicide bombings, let's just lay the whole thing aside and forget it. Don't Good. You? Good question. Do you think Israelis would really care? Because I, I sense no urgency in Israel. You are right on. The whole peace movement in Israel has basically collapsed. There's a little semblance of peace now. They make a little rally now and then, and I know them exceedingly well. And when you talk to them, they sort of say to you, I've lost heart. Whatever we do, nothing happens. And one of our friends summed it up by saying, que sera, sera, you know, fatalistic. What will be, will be. I, I don't see how we can influence this anymore. That is the worst part of failure, because in the end, there has to be a sense within Israel that we cannot continue 40 more years of occupation for what it has done to the Israeli psyche, to the Israeli nation, to how the world sees Israel. Yes, it's easy enough if you live in Israel to say, don't bother me, as long as they're not throwing bombs, everything is okay. And that's basically the sentiment of the country. So when I read the polls that you quote all the time in your newsletter and, and others, Sure, if you ask somebody, are you for peace? Who says they're not for peace? You ask it, and that's where it's at. Right, right back here, this, this lady, yes. Uh, Andrea Barron, George Mason University. Yeah, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on how Hamas practically accepted the Arab initiative. And second, uh, if Hamas was to come around, what would it do to prevent uh, attacks by Islamic Jihad and the Popular Struggle Committees um, that are still going on? <laughs> Good question. So, um, okay. Well, uh, first of all, about uh, Hamas acceptance of the Arab Initiative, I think that was uh, very clear in two ways. First of all, when the Palestinian delegation to the Arab Summit that re-adopted the Arab Initiative one more time took place, the delegation included President Abbas <coughs> and Prime Minister Haniyeh at the time, who was representing <coughs> Hamas and the government. And uh, the Palestinian delegation with Haniya in it declared that it is accepting the Arab initiative. Uh, more than that, Khalid Mash'al at the time came out and uh, said in a press conference that Hamas is ready to accept what the Arab leaders are ready to accept. I think that was a clear indication. And then in our, uh, the most important document that was, I don't know why it was so ignored. It, it really pissed me off, but uh, <laughs> because I participated so hard in writing it, and in uh, creating it as a good document, uh, it was the program of our government, of the National Unity Government. The program, please look, go back and look at it. It's a very peaceful, it, actually it was more progressive than any other document before on women's rights, on uh, human rights, on international humanitarian law, and on the rights of people with disability. It was a good thing. And 
it clearly indicated readiness for peace based on two-state solution. So the thing was there. Uh, but unfortunately, it was ignored. I want uh, also to comment on, on a, about a previous question, if you allow me. Certainly. I want to just make one piggyback on your comment. The, yeah, the comment you're talking about preceded September of last year. And I was with Daniel at that point when the president gave his statement on the Middle East, including on Palestine and Israel, and it sounded on one level quite forthcoming. And privately, and I won't say who, but maybe he's up here, spent some time with some of the Palestinians who were incredibly depressed because after these statements of, of, of the forthcoming nature on, uh, uh, by Hamas and by the government, uh, essentially the Bush administration were telling Abbas, you must go back and break it apart. Right. Is, that, is that incorrect? No. no. <laughs> okay, yes, and I apologize. Uh, the, the other comment I wanted to make is about this whole issue. You, you, you referred to the economic uh, progress and so on. I'm sure this was said, but... Uh, I think the World Bank uh, made a very good report, actually more than one good report, in which it says very clearly you cannot have economic development in this little place if you don't remove the checkpoints and allow freedom of movement. It is really funny when they come and say we want to create a very big industrial project here in Jericho when the residents of this village called Tubas cannot sell their tomato to the nearby Nablus, you know. Uh, with with checkpoints around, with this obstacle. It's not about even export and import. It's about Palestinians being able to transport <coughs> fruits or vegetables or uh, industrial products from one city to another. It's impossible uh, for the time. Not to talk about a complete embargo on Gaza where none of us can get to Gaza and none of the people of Gaza can come to us. As a matter of fact, I, as a member of parliament and as a previous minister, and a person who calls for nonviolence all the time is not allowed to go to Jerusalem. I cannot go to Jerusalem since many, many, many months, although I was born there and I worked there for 14 years. I need a permit to go there and I cannot get it. I cannot go to all this yellow area, which is the Jordan Valley, 24% of the West Bank, because also it requires a permit. And I cannot go to Gaza. So how can you have economic de uh, development with this situation? The other aspect which is very important is this whole issue of security. I need to say that. The whole concept of making the Palestinian Authority responsible for providing <coughs> security to Israel is, is wrong and undoable and cannot be done. The whole idea that people who are under occupation, and I don't think this has happened ever before in human history, People who are under occupation are responsible for provision of security to their occupiers who are a super military power is really crazy because and it is hurting their possibility of having a real good Palestinian authority. I'll give you one last example and then I'll stop. Before, uh, before elections, one of the problems that the Palestinian Authority had was that it was devoting in its budget only 9% to healthcare and less than 1% to agriculture and 27% uh, of the budget went to security because it was asked by the international community to build a very big security apparatus. Now with Fayyad government in place, I looked at the budget the other day, I asked him to give me his new budget and it showed the following. Budget for health has gone down from 9 to 8%. Budget for agriculture has gone down to 0.7%. The budget for culture is 0.3%. And the budget for security has jumped from 27% to 38%. Even the Soviet Union could not tolerate that, you know. So that is, that is a situation where you put the Palestinian government or authority in front of an impossible mission. And that is a very good way of, uh, to, to keep this, uh, to keep, uh, you know, undermining its legitimacy. Thank you. Uh, Mike Olshausen. <coughs> I'm Mike Olshausen. Um, Jews did not really return Can't to you? Palestine. Jews did not really return to Palestine until the end of the 19th century and accelerated to the 20th century. Now, state. And they had been kicked out many, many hundreds of years before. It's a long time sometimes before you return to the place that you lost. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time for Palestinians to realize that it's not going to happen. You need to leave. You can certainly sell 
your property. There are plenty of willing takers. And then for all these settlements, it will be coalesced, and you will have maybe 2,000 takers. Okay. <laughs> you want uh, me to respond to that? Uh, <laughs> I don't I, I, really I get I much response. response. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, uh, history goes much faster these days than it used to be <laughs> <laughs> with all this technology. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess the 2,000 years could be a bit smaller. But, uh, you know, uh, I think... Uh, what, what ought to be clear here is, actually, your question is very good because it indicates the reality. If we really uh, take all the covers apart and look at the substance, what Israel is doing is uh, not only not allowing Palestinian refugees to come back, but actually it is trying to create social and economic and political conditions so that the Palestinians who are already living there will also leave. But, uh, but, but, uh, but the, in my opinion, this is impossible. I'll tell you why. For two reasons. First of all, I know our people well, and uh, they won't leave. They're not going to leave. First of all, because they're attached to their, as anybody would be attached to his home, to his <coughs> country, to his land. But there is a second very important reason. There is no other place to go to. People are not attached to their homeland because of the land itself. People at are attached to their right for dignity, to their right for freedom, to their right to feel that they have a home, a safe home they can be in. And uh, that's why I think this whole notion that uh, eventually all Palestinians will leave is just... Well, Saeed Erkot, the chief negotiator for Palestine, has also publicly said, uh, okay, if we don't get a deal with Israel, We'll just keep having lots of babies. And by that, the demographic reality in 20 years, not 2,000 years, 20 years, creates a situation which uh, the Jewish nature of the Israeli state is over, essentially. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Tomer, uh, Rabbi Zavitz from UCLA. Uh, I have two questions. One, I mentioned this, it's very important. Uh, Palestinians are So the question for those who couldn't hear is, how can you prevent things from getting worse? I'm not sure you can. Uh, second, uh, what sorts of things do you do to basically set up the next administration? Well, on the very practical, I think if you could get uh, an agreement, at least if you were negotiating with Hamas or indirectly talking to Hamas, that they would lay off further terrorism in exchange for opening the checkpoints and flow of electricity, power, and all of that. And I think Hamas would be very receptive to that because I think they are somewhere at the end of their rope. They are, they are literally bankrupt and then some. And <clears throat> there is no way that they can provide for their people. So that's something, a role maybe the UN could play as an intermediary there if the US doesn't want to talk directly to Hamas. But that would make things better on the ground. Um, going forward, is I, I pretty much elaborated what I think. I don't think anything is going to happen just between the two parties, given the structure now. I think you have to engage the broader Arab world. And as we have said, the Arab world is ready, eager, anxious to be involved. They have the Arab initiative. It is still on the table. They're, they have not withdrawn it in any way or form. So that's what you, you have to look forward to. But I'm going to come back to the earlier question, which I took you meant as a serious question. And I don't think that it, it's plausible to imagine that the Palestinians are going to leave their land. However, what Steve said is what is the most troubling to me, because when you talk to Palestinian intellectuals who are in the forefront of the two-state solution and willing to recognize Israel and so on, you know, 20 years ago and led, and led all up to Oslo, they now talk, I've dropped that, and they talk about a one-state solution, right. that over time there will be a demographic process, and the demographic process is running very heavily against Israel and in favor of the Palestinians. 
Many Russian Jews have left Israel. They, have, they now have gone back to Russia or Germany or any place in the European Union where they find better economic life. There are very few immigrants to speak of to Israel, except some religious types, but there's no more mass immigration movement. The Israeli demographic rate is, what is it, three times? Seven. Yeah, but it's about three times lower than the yeah. Palestinian well, rate. <clears throat> so, you know, the demography will take its effect over time. Will, will, it, will it take its effect peacefully, or will it result in some, you know, horrific violence? I can't predict. But that's certainly where the Palestinian intellectual drift is going, and I find that very lamentable because it's giving up on the prospect of a diplomatic reason solution between the two sides. Mm. Yeah, but I really want to move on, but, but okay, so we, yeah. We can talk after. Okay, yeah, right in the, behind you. Okay, um, <clears throat> when I sit in this room and hear the three speakers and moderator people in the room, I'm in one world, and it makes sense, and there's a compellingness to it. And then when I think back to what's on the ground and what the disintegration, the attacks on the state of Lebanon and the way that state has been disintegrated, one of the countries we all talk about is being our helper in solving the Middle East problem. Syria, when we look at bringing all the Arab neighbors together, and Syria has been busy causing the assassinations of the Lebanese government officials. Or someone wanting to make it look like Syria was doing so. And, well, they seem to have convinced a lot of people that they're behind much of it. And, um, <coughs> and then you look at Hezbollah. Way of getting along with one's neighbors. You've got on the, on, in the Gaza, you've got the tunnels from Egypt into Gaza bringing in mortar and the artillery and tanks into the Gaza Strip to be used against Israel. You've got uh, Hezbollah getting armed from abroad from the Arab neighbors. Um, you've got a Palestinian state in the area already on the Palestinian. And it really does look like a bigger problem than we can solve at the Nationalists. Well, I hope you didn't think from listening to the, the, the four of us, we thought Annapolis would one producer solve all those problems. I think our doubts have been clear, but, but any quick reactions? And then I want to go to Matt I think Iglesias. you just reiterated yeah. what I said. All of these problems are now in one big ball of wax, and you can't disaggregate them anymore, which is why it is so complicated. But the idea of there's a state of Jordan that is going to take up the Palestinians, you can forget about that. I mean, the Jordanians are formally declared their opposition to that, as you know, and they are not willing to take in Palestinians and see Jordan become a completely Palestinian state. Those solutions just don't work. I mean, there are a lot of nice ideas things people throw out, but they, they're I mean, not workable. I don't mean to interrupt, but also read Nir Rosen's material, another fellow at New America Foundation who's written eloquently about the Palestinian refugee nightmare that continues in many of these other Arab states in the region, but how in a place like Jordan, which is carrying 1.1 <coughs> million Iraqi refugees today, you actually have a repeat of the refugee crisis that we had uh, uh, you know, somewhat th 35 years ago uh, in terms of, of, of those realities and looking at what happens in these so-called Arab states. It's, it's, it's not, it, you know, they're, they're a real brewing problem. Syria is carrying about a million uh, Iraqi refugees today. Uh, the United Nations is out actually publicly thanking Syria and Jordan, of all things, and we're doing not, not, nothing uh, that I know of to basically deal with those elements. But uh, Mustafa wanted to comment, then I want to go to Matt Iglesias. Mustafa? Well, I'm glad we're getting these kinds of questions because they bring us to reality and uh, that such a thinking exists here in the United States. And uh, my response to that is three things. First of all, of course, Israel can keep running away from the problem and from the possibility of a solution by uh, clutching each time to a particular problem, problem somewhere else. First, it was the Soviet Union and uh, 
Cold War, and uh, that was the reason why they couldn't make an agreement with the Palestinians. Then it became Syria and Hezbollah, and now, of course, it's Iran, and uh, maybe tomorrow it's going to be Azerbaijan. I don't know. But uh, if Israel keeps running away from the problem itself, which is there on the ground, which is Palestinians there, sitting there, and that they need a solution, I don't think uh, it, it, it will achieve much. Second question, uh, second issue is that uh, what you're saying to me is that you, the Palestinians who've lived for thousands of years in your land, don't have the right to be in your home. Do you realize what that means? Uh, can I say that to French people, for instance? Can I say that to, I mean, can I say that to the Jewish people who haven't been there for thousands of years and who decided to come back? Can I use the same argument? Of course not. You wouldn't accept. But why would it be acceptable to say that to Palestinians but not to Israelis? Because the only explanation is that you accept racism. You accept a discrimination against people. And as long as Israelis or pro-Israelis keep thinking that Palestinians are less of human beings than Jewish people or Israeli people, there will be no solution. <coughs> the basic fact is that the, the, the ba basic entry point to any solution is to accept us as equal human beings with equal rights and equal duties. There is no other way. And uh, the third point is that uh, the possibility of deporting Palestinians out of, out of West Bank and Gaza and Israel itself now, because there is about 1.5 million Palestinians also living inside Israel. By the way, the numbers are equal now. The number of Palestinians and Israelis inside the land of Eretz Israel or historical Palestine is equal, 5 million versus 5, 5 million. They're the same. The options that are in front of us are only two. Either there will be two-state solution or there will be one-state solution with apartheid that could go on for 20 years, 30 years as status quo, but eventually it cannot last because it cannot last. It's wrong and it's inconsistent with logic and inconsistent with human rights and inconsistent with human nature. It would not last, which means Israel has to make the decision whether it wants a two-state solution and in that case a Palestinian state have to be sovereign, have to be in control of its own borders, and have to be according to 67 borders and nothing less. Or Israel wants a one-state solution. If we have to live under apartheid and struggle to be free from this oppression, we're ready to do so. But then, I don't think it's something interesting or even something that Israelis could be proud about, which is creating an apartheid system in the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, Matt Iglesias. Yes, um, I guess I'm, I, I've heard from, from, from a lot of people here about, uh, I guess what you call a, a lack of urgency on the Israeli side, just a not a real sense that they need, that their interests would be particularly served by, by getting an agreement at, at this time. I wonder, I, I guess, especially to, to Daniel, what would need to change to generate that sense of urgency? Because obviously you, you can't have a difficult agreement unless both sides. In, into the microphone yeah. uh, my, my, my kind of answer to what you said, Matt, and, and to what MJ said earlier about we can quote the polls till we go blue in the face, but where are the Israelis out there demanding this? Why, why, aren't, why isn't there a different atmosphere? Is Why can the Israelis just carry on and ignore this is kind of the answer to why dogs lick certain private parts of their anatomies, because they can. Uh, and it's, it's Occupation Deluxe. Now, how can Occupation Deluxe be challenged? Occupation Deluxe can be challenged by violence. The normal response, on in, not exclusively, by the way, and I think it's, it's, it's not crazy to cite that the violence in Lebanon got the IDF out, and part of uh, the IDF withdrawing from Gaza was, was not disconnected from violence. But it doesn't create a... It, it, the, the pushback against violence tends to be, let's hit them harder, not let's leave. When there's no violence, by the way, Israelis just carry on you know, getting on with life. The economy is doing very, very well. So what could be the other equations that would change occupation deluxe? <clears throat> One would be if there was really a price to pay day to day, South Africa. Mm. Um, I don't see the world coming to that position anytime soon at all. Uh, I think the Israeli pushback has very, been very effective, and I don't advocate that. 
The third one would be something that's, that's, that's neither of those two, but if the enabler says we will no longer play that enabling role. To wit, the U.S. Bizarre. Let me let me add a <coughs> let me add a scarier scenario that I think would 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 drive the demand uh, for a deal, but that would come very late. I'm worried very much about what the United States is planning to do with Iran, and I don't think we're soberly looking for those friends, yeah, MJ and others out there whom I sort of know virtually. I'm a hardcore. Uh, I would call 21st century realist as opposed to uh, the 20th century or 19th century realist. But when you look soberly at various things that could happen, what Rita was saying to think about the next step and the next next step, to look at what an interaction, a hot interaction or exchange, no matter whether it was precipitated by the Al-Quds force or, or an accident or, you know, somebody that Dick Cheney nudged one way or the other, uh, to precipitate something that would escalate into a hot crisis. You know, I worry a lot, you know, Flint, Le Flint Leverett, my colleague here, has talked a lot about uh, the so-called resistance and, and the um, state of enemy affairs between Iran and the Taliban. Well, Flint makes the case that, that the reason that, that Iran helped us in the Bonn Conference, brought the warlords together, fought the Taliban and others, was in part because they wanted a better relationship with the United States. Well, today they're working both with the Karzai government and with the Taliban. They're playing both sides. And of course, when they're playing with Taliban, Iran is playing with Al-Qaeda. Now, I tell you, what's scary is to look at the sophistication of Iranian networks through the Middle East and some of the crazier elements of Al-Qaeda. Now, is the focus Israel? No. The focus is the Jordanian government, the Saudi government, and the Egyptian government, and toppling them. And so you could have, when you talk about scenarios, I think that the only way forward, you need to project two or three decades ahead for Israel to survive, but also moderate Sunni regimes to survive, is essentially something that looks like an ASEAN regional forum in the Middle East, a loose security alliance, not between Israel and Europe and NATO, but between Israel and, and moderate uh, uh, Sunni governments. And if that doesn't come forward in some sort of step, then you see uh, an environment which is not that Israel will fall, but its potential long-term allies in the region would fall. That, that I think could begin happening with a, with a conflict with Iran, and then Israel would say, well, we need a deal, we need a deal. But by that time, the levees are gone, and the floodplain is real. So I have to apologize yeah. that this levy has to go now. Yeah. Uh, please. Okay. You, 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 uh, let, let me, uh, so, <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> so, so appreciative that you gave we're gonna, so I, I think we're going to use that in YouTube. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, thank you very much. I want to take these last two questions and comments here, and then we'll close up as well. But Daniel, thank you very much. Well, maybe, maybe yes. to conclude this, which has been yeah. fascinating, that's why I believe the only way forward is the, the nature of a big conference right. called by the United States for the moderate Arab leadership, however you define moderate, to come together and try to deal with the entire region and make Israel understand that its future lies in settling its problem within that kind of context. Right. And the only actor that is, is available is us. And unfortunately, us, we, we don't usually do it right if we do it at all. But it did happen. It did happen at Madrid. Madrid was a giant leap forward in this process. It did happen in smaller ways when we really put ourselves to it. So I guess I'm saying a lot depends on who's the next president. And don't ask me who that'll be because I don't know. But I, I have my desires. But I, I would certainly hope that we are not going to continue a bellicose policy that we have unleashed in the last few years in which the answer to every problem in the Middle East is force, since it's produced very little that has any salutary result that I can see. I, I want to ask the indulgence of my two friends that raised questions and ask them to come up afterward, and, 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 and both you, because I know you are, always have great, great comments, but we're just out of time. But Mustafa, why don't you um, offer any final thoughts you have uh, on this issue, and then, and then we'll bring the program to a close. Well, I think I've said what I should say, but uh, I think the question here is, uh, I think Danny said something very interesting, which is that maybe Israel does what it does because it can do that, and it, can, it, it has this feeling of impunity and uh, that it is above international law, and simply that is possible because the United States provides the protection and the cover and the... but. Um, I think that is okay for people who, have, who are short-sighted. Any person who has a vision about the future in the region and about the future of the world, because things will not remain as is, uh, will definitely 
make efforts to change this course because this course is very destructive and it will have very serious long-term consequences. And uh, again, I repeat what uh, was just said. Uh, there is an opportunity, but the opportunities don't last. Mm -hmm. If they are not used, they could disappear. I want to thank uh, Rita and Daniel Absentia and Mustafa uh, Barghouti for joining us, all of you for your patience. I wish we'd been able to get to all of the questions, which I normally do. Um, and, and just say a quick word, because New America Foundation is deeply uh, engaged in these issues. And what we're deeply opposed to is ritual in foreign policy, uh, a ritualized process of dealing with an issue that just sort of is allowed. I used to live in Los Angeles. And uh, around the time of the Rodney King riots, uh, the Rodney King insurrection, whatever political correct term there was, I realized how L.A. was put together. L.A. was essentially put together where the west side, the east side, the, or the west side, the valley, we could all, the, the sort of wealthy parts could reach each other with thoroughfares without really meddling in East L.A. or going in. And to some degree, it's a good composite to sort of think about the world, that you can jump from airport to airport or, you know, you know uh, uh, one rich spa to another, and eventually avoid the messy parts of the world, but eventually it will come back. But my view is that Los Angeles kind of did a deal where it says every 20 years we're going to have a riot. That's okay. We can cost it. It's a cost that's endurable. My view is that the, that the geostrategic costs of failure in this particular case now not only matter with Israel-Palestine, but actually involve key geostrategic interests of the United States throughout the region and I think globally. Uh, and I think it's no failure when you see the failure of everything from the Doha round and lots of other collapses of international deal making uh, that that has at its root the doubt in America's ability to deliver. So uh, that's what we're engaged in. I hope you'll remain involved with us. Please uh, extend a hand of thanks to Rita Houser. <laughs> and, uh,